you. Um, I'm, as uh, mentioned, I'm Neil Redfern. I'm the Principal Inspector of Ancient Monuments for Historic England in Yorkshire. And I have had the gr great good fortune or deep misery to be involved in the upgrade of the A1 for all of my 16 years with English Heritage Historic England in Yorkshire. I know this road very, very well. So, basically, I'm now going to try and go through what I think I've learned from the 16 years. Um, and hopefully, when we get through all this, um, they'll roughly fall into seven um, different ca cat categories, okay? Relating to issues around design and build schemes, the design manual for road and bridges, what is mitigation, um, who is it for, um, preservation, the idea of how we deal with stuff through PPG 16 methodologies. I'm going to touch on contractual arrangements and I'm going to touch on procurement because these things all influence <coughs> whether you can actually say you're doing research or not. But the first thing I'm going to tell you in what I really learned about road schemes in Yorkshire is absolutely do not have me on your road scheme. Because okay? <laughs> if you do, you will find stuff. You will find shed loads of stuff. You will find so much stuff you won't know what to do with it. I, I'm saying this and I, in some senses I hope I am cursed and I never find anything else. Because I do seem to have a knack of finding some lovely things. And you're going to see that. Okay, things that were unforeseen, and now it's great and exciting, and it makes you have to think really quickly. But hey, it does actually cost money, lots of money. I cost the government money. Okay, now what I find really interesting is my job is not to do that. My job is not to do archaeology. Okay, that's the point I have in my life, and I'm going to hopefully try and explore some of these things. And by the time we get to the end of that, and I'm going to give you lots of questions, and you can, this is, you can disagree with me, I don't mind. These are my observations. Okay? I'm going to tell you the three things I most hate in archaeology. Okay? And I think really do need to change. But I'm also hopefully going to see how we might just look at things differently and do them differently. Now, the first thing about the A1 is we've done shed loads. Okay? Effectively, what we've done, without really knowing it, but we do now, is we've looked at an emerging Roman frontier over 60 miles. Now, I have the great good fortune to have worked with a, a colleague in English Heritage called Pete Wilson. Pete is Mr. Roman. He wrote the two Catterick volumes, okay? And he would say he doesn't think there's anywhere else in the Roman world where we've looked at a frontier as it emerges, as it moves forward over that depth. Wow, okay? It's just a shame that actually I'm now telling you this 16 years after we started doing this work. What would we have actually looked at if we'd said, let's, let's think about that at the beginning? Okay. So we've looked at lots of stuff, and we found lots of stuff. Yes, Iron Age chariot, lovely. Uh, actually, should never have found it. We'll come back on to that. Okay. Should never have actually dug it. <coughs> Didn't need to, digging. Um, my favourite thing, though, was this lovely burial. Bronze Age burial, and why I loved it so much. I, I don't like the beaker folk, I don't believe in them, but this guy was an archer. He had the most perfect stone wrist guard I have ever seen. It was absolutely gorgeous. Now, unfortunately, he was found near this chariot, so no one ever heard about him. Okay, because, woo, big treasure, that's what we like to talk about. Okay, so we've done lots of, lots and lots and lots of archaeology, but over the last four years, We've actually been um, engaged in this smaller stretch that actually runs from Leeming to Barton. Um, and you can see it on the map there. And obviously, we've, we've got a good idea of what's going on in this landscape. Why? Well, it's Deer Street. It's a Roman road, a number of scheduled sites on it, particularly Bayness and Catterick. So we, we had a really good idea that there was lots of archaeology. Also, in the 1950s, when we built the A1, the first time, well, no, not the first time, because the Romans built it the first time, when we went back and built it third, fourth, fifth time, um, we found a lot of stuff at Catterick, including this. This here is a Roman bathhouse, okay? And, of course, what we did with Roman bathhouses in the 50s and then the way of the road is we just bulldozed it, okay? It, stand, it stood up to the size of a barn, an, an incredible but that is now in the middle of the actual highway. So we, we had a pretty good idea of what we were actually getting ourselves in for. But this is where we encountered our first issue, procurement. Okay, 
Originally, this road scheme was, was a, a much larger road scheme of about 20 miles. Um, and as we were progressing through developing the whole 20 miles, there was a local objector uh, in one part of the road scheme up near Catra, uh, Scott's Corner. So what actually happened is Highways England decided to split the road scheme in two. Okay? And we did the southern bit. Nice and easy, just one scheduled monument and not too many problems. And we had our questions and we looked at them and they were all absolutely fantastic. Um, we then started to look through at this scheme and of course the, um, the crash happened. So this scheme is ditched. So, you know, 15 years of thinking about how to build a road through Catterick all comes to an end. Okay? Until George Osborne decides he wants a shovel ready scheme. He wants to spend some money. So suddenly all hell breaks loose. Loads and loads of activity to actually get this scheme going. And of course, what everyone did was they underestimated the cost because they wanted George Osborne to say yes. Okay? Because they'd always already invested so much time trying to develop this road scheme. And we were all under pressure. Even I was. Yeah, this was this was about getting the country building. Okay? So we rushed it. Okay? And I would safely say we probably rushed it a bit too quick and we didn't sort all those problems out. But procurement, a really, really critical issue when we're actually looking at how we move forward. Um, our strategy was very, very clear. We didn't want to do archaeology. Okay? Because what do you do, to, how do you put a motorway through an entire Roman town? Okay? We can't go round it because that's about a 10 mile detour. So our solution was to stay online. Okay, so this um, here, the red is where the road currently exists with the archaeology taken out in the 50s, and then you can see the geophysics of the Roman town either side of it. And we just said, right, let's go through it. And we we're going to do that by taking the cutting and battering it back, so making it steeper. On one side, we were going to use soil nails, which are what these are, and on the other side, we were going to use a revetment wall. Absolutely fine. No archaeology. What a success. This is how you go straight through a, a scheduled monument without doing anything. Um, of course, that's when I learned about my second issue. Design and build schemes. This was a contract uh, that is on a design and build. And lo and behold, the contractor hadn't actually finished designing this road. So when it came to it, of course, they couldn't just do the revetment walls and they couldn't just do the soil nails, could they? And immediately we started to get different designs coming forward. And the first thing that actually happened is near where the, one of the bridges over the, the bridge over the River Swale was going to go, they actually needed to do quite a major piece of engineering that required a large area excavation, which is what you see going on here. Okay? Now, Again, luckily, I had Pete Wilson. Pete, what do we want to know about this place? What are the really critical things? We set up three questions. One was the very earliest origins of the town. We hadn't actually really encountered that before. Second one, where was the bridge? Can we find the gate to the town that led to the bridge? And then the third one, what's the relationship of the houses to the road? So not a set of nice questions. The only problem was, to get to the depth we needed to go, they didn't have enough area in the CPO boundary. Okay. So what we did is we negotiated with them. I actually said, well, I'm happy that you don't do archaeology on the west side because we, we're not really sure we're going to learn anything there. We're not, really, we're not too worried about the level of impact. What I'd like you to do is double the area and actually go outside the CPO boundary so that we can answer these questions. So again, what I was doing was saying, what is the knowledge I actually want to learn? And we were successful and we actually did that and it was great and I thought, fantastic. We've got all the archaeology sorted on this scheme. I can go away. Well, that was until we then had to move north of the river. So again, the green section up there, where again, this is instead of being in a cutting, the road now goes onto an embankment, and they need to double the width of the embankment. Absolutely fine. We were going to look at the archaeology, characterise it, and then we were happy it was going to live comfortably under the embankment. Not preserve it in situ, it's just going to stay under the embankment. Not much archaeology. They needed a roadside drain. Excellent. We knew in the 1950s they put a sopping great drain next to this road. We just said, can you use that again, please? And they said, absolutely fine. Until they decided they couldn't. And I kid you not, what they wanted to do, if you look at the bottom image, is they wanted to put a 600 millimetre diameter 
pipeline up to seven metres deep in places through this entire section of archaeology. Okay? Um, it was like, just what the hell? Where do you start? What do you do with that? Um, the, the, the impact was just vast. And of course, none of it had been programmed. Um, there was a crane booked to build a bridge. And that is a lot of money. How do you actually come around this? So what we actually said was, well, you're going to have to do all that archaeology. Ah, That then led us to actually revise and actually come up with a methodology about how to actually do it. And what we actually tried to do was, as, again, as little as possible. So we chose two areas where we thought we should characterise the deposits properly. One related to um, an area of, of town de defences and one uh, related to an area of dense settlement. And then in the middle section, we were happy that most of it was going to remain under the embankment and we got them to move the pipeline into a less sensitive area. So again, there was a bit of negotiation. But what was really interesting here is this is where another issue starts coming up. Costs started to escalate. Of course, none of these costs had been factored in anywhere. Okay? And at this time, in some senses, we, we were okay. We were dealing with the joint venture. But, of course, the joint venture then were actually going to their paymasters, the highways agency. And this is where I learned about the issue of contractual arrangements. Okay, absolutely fantastic. I thought I was having a great conversation with the archaeologists who were controlling the engineers and reducing costs. What actually turned out to happen is um, the contract from Highways England to the joint venture seemingly allowed, without much um, uh, robust uh, defence, the archaeological costs to be passed back to the highways agent, Highways England. Okay. So what this actually meant, from my experience, is I've just felt the designers were out of control. They actually had no cost um, uh, criticality about what they were doing. So no matter how much we said, oh, it's going to cost you six, well, actually, I, yeah, it was millions. That's going to cost you a million pounds. They didn't seem to care. Okay? <coughs> well, that's a disaster because you can't court sense when that's actually happening. Now, obviously, there was an organisation that did care about this, and that was Highways England. And whole hell breaks then loose when they realise cost is getting a real, real issue. Okay? Now, what that actually came out is, is when, what is our focus here on this scheme? What are our values? What are we learning by actually doing this? And so, again, there starts to be a lot of pressure going back. What were our questions to actually start off with? Well, of course, we didn't have any questions because we weren't going to do any archaeology. We, we decided not to do that because we found a way of building this road. But no, the design started change. So we've got design and build. We've got um, procurement. We've got contractual arrangements. Oh, hell, then... Uh, sorry, so Then we have actually complexity, okay, and slightly unexpected fines. So um, we end up finding a grave, a Roman graveyard, okay, a Roman cemetery, which is fine. You can normally expect that in one of the scheduled monuments. This actually ended up turning up to have over 220 uh, bodies in this and about 40 cremations. So it's now the largest Roman rural cemetery in the whole of the north of England. Okay. And again, one of the really interesting things there is the cemetery. You can't just leave it. This is actually under the main line of the road. Okay, so we actually have to start dealing with that. So then, really interestingly, you know, there were legitimate reasons why archaeology was causing a problem um, on the actual road schemes. When they actually dug this site, it was extraordinary that you couldn't see one grave cut from the other. I kid you not, you couldn't see it. The only way they found them, they effectively excavated them horizontally. They fell into one grave after another. It is, so in a sense, it was an extraordinary piece of archaeology, but it just wouldn't stop. You just wanted it to stop. You just got this impression. <laughs> but then, but, so that's going on. And then, uh, what, I've got, I'm not really explaining very well. All these things are happening in parallel time. Yeah? They're not one after the other. They're all starting to come at the same time. So then, then we go up to Scotch Corner. And what we end up finding is an entire Roman settlement that we didn't really know was there. Not only is it an entire Roman settlement, the artefacts are extraordinary. They are extremely high status. But they seem to be telling us that the Romans were there in about AD 60. Oops, not really fitting in with the established chronologies of what's going on in this sort of landscape. What is actually going on? And not only that, we just keep finding stuff. And then, to cap it all, we find Iron Age coal coin pellet moulds. 
well, you don't find them in the north of England, so these are the most northerly example in the whole of Europe. Okay, and there are shed loads of them. What is going on? Okay, this is all coming on. Now, by this stage, costs are really going up, and we're thinking, what the hell are we going to do with post-excavation? Okay, because we had a little budget, and now I'm potentially saying, you've got to have a really big budget. Okay, and so again, with discussions with the highways. England, we tried to say, well, can we establish a fixed post-excavation cost? And I'm saying, well, you can't, because I don't know what the end cost of the excavations are at this stage. How do I do this? What we did do, though, is we wrote a research strategy. We said, right, we've got to stop. What are our most important questions? What are they? Clearly, Scotch Corner totally changed the intellectual emphasis of what we were looking at, because this is about early Roman material. This is about that border extending north. And indeed, some further geophysics was done at um, Scotch Corner. Just just shows this the extraordinary level of material that's there and the potential story that is actually encapsulated in this stuff. And not only least, you have two Roman roads colliding into each other, forming a crossroads. Um, one's called Deer Street, one's called Stainmore. So, you know, quite important little things really going on there. But this enabled us to actually get some focus. And actually, I thought, brilliant, we can calm down, we can actually peg things to life. Absolutely fantastic. Um, no. No. No, that's not what happened, because, of course, what happens is I still haven't got my engineers in control. Okay, they're still going off the side and do things that are really, really quite crazy. Now, one of the strategies we had, we had to replace this bridge. Okay, which is fine. And the strategy was, well, we thought in the 1950s they, they just destroyed everything. So what we were going to do is when they take, took the old bridge out, we were just going to move gently forwards. And when we found some archaeology, we were going to clean the section and create a nice section, sample it and walk away and say, right, that's job done. We don't really need to know that much more. OK, absolutely fine. The unfortunate thing is they didn't actually destroy as much archaeology in the 50s as we thought. Fine. Strategy was still the same. Clean it up, sample it. Have we characterised it? How does it fit with our questions? Absolutely fine. Until... The engineers came along and said, well, of course, what we really need to do is we need to stabilise the bank. And the way we're going to stabilise the bank is we're going to use soil nails. OK, I said, that's fine. We've got a strategy for soil nails. Put them under the archaeology. Yeah, the top three metres of the embankment is archaeology. Below that, absolutely fine. Don't worry about that. Oh, no, we need to go into your top three metres. OK, so what are your soil nails? How big are they? Oh, well, they're 11 metres long. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. And what's their diameter? Oh, well, the rod's only about 30 centimetres. Oh, so, so nothing. Yeah, but we actually dig a hole that's about a foot wide. We put the rod in, then we pump it full of concrete. Oh. Oh. Excellent. What do I do then? So what we said is, well, you can't do that. That's destroying nationally important archaeology. It's scheduled to come up with another strategy. Um, and this is where we hit a different problem. Six months before that... We had dealt with all the services that went over this bridge. We'd taken them up and out of the ground. We had created a temporary bridge, laid all beautifully on top of the archaeology. I love there's a national footpath, so that was all laid. No impact on the archaeology, because the job is not to have any impact on the archaeology. Okay? <laughs> the problem is, is that is here. So if I wanted them not to use soil nails, they would have had to have moved that bridge with another six months delay, whilst they moved all the services again so they could do it. So we actually, in the end, had to agree that this area of archaeology here was lost. There was no way of actually mitigating it. Okay? We did actually negotiate a much better uh, uh, archaeological assessment of the land, uh, the area to the north of it, but I was just in this trap. There was nowhere I could actually go in this scenario. You know, risk, but I'm sorry. Research is now out of the question in this. So this, is, this is disaster management, if you like, uh, in, in the extreme. And what's great is the archaeology was archaeology in the extreme as well. This is eight metres above a functioning, fully live, dual carriageway A road. Okay? And literally, at the end where the revetment is, you just drop off onto this motorway. So it was seriously difficult archaeology in a seriously difficult location with a massive time constraint actually built in. Okay. Now, again, we were able to focus, we were able to answer some questions, we, we had our research strategy, so we, I felt we were really comfortable in the way we were actually being focused. But what was interesting is how some of these issues were playing out elsewhere. What I was suddenly encountering in this road scheme is 
The actual main line of the road was never a problem in this road scheme. It's easy. I knew where it was going, and we agreed it. That was our first cultural heritage decision, the line of the road. What we then had to deal with was all the implications of the services, okay, and boreholes. So these two guys here, they are in a pit, and they're in a pit solely to clear the area so that the, uh, the ground investigation team can put a small circular borehole in there. Why am I making them do all this archaeology? Well, we know there are sucking great stone buildings in there, so if you try and bore through them, you're going to trash lots. You're probably not going to be able to bore through them. So they actually have to go in and sterilise it. But there's no point digging a one metre square hole in this Roman town. You, you don't learn anything from that. So I actually have to ask for two metres, of course, by the time you actually get to the bottom, it's three metres deep, you have to step out. Oh my God, I, look what that mass I made. I don't want to do archaeology, I just made a huge hole. Okay, now the, this rig here, if the farm wanted a new electrical supply, and do you know what, I gave up at this point. I said, it is ridiculous doing the archaeology, just bore the whole pole in. Drill the hole and put it in. Because actually, I'm just creating stuff that, just, just stuff that's not really telling us anything. And it's madness. And I just said, let's please, just, I'm very happy. Let's just go and put the, the poles in. Because the guy needs to farm the land, he needs to live there. Let's, let's think about his um, impact and his legacy. But this wasn't unique. I had this with services all over the place. So again, going back to north of the river, where this brown line goes up there, that turns out to be a high-pressure sewer main, okay? Now, the embankment's supposed to be widened out absolutely fine. The pipe is there. It's beautiful. Put in in the 1990s. It's a gorgeous piece of engineering. No, Yorkshire Water would not accept it living under the embankment, okay? They said, no, we want a new pipe outside, and we want our own access. And so, literally, that was nine months' archaeology, half a million pounds, because I couldn't, there was just no stopping this process. There was nothing I think. I literally just had to say, hi, where's England? You've got to do the archaeology. And I said, there's going to be burials in there, and there's no way you can just get piled through those. And lo and behold, the picture there is, is archaeology. Um, the bottom guys down here, they, they're sorting out North Yorkshire County Council's requirement for a storm attenuation drain. Why do they want the storm attenuation drain? Because the new bridge has a bigger service area, so we'll catch more water that if it goes into the drains, will flood somewhere. So they want a bigger pipe. And they literally wanted 70 metres long, both sides of this road, in the schedule monument, 300 millimetre diameter pipe. Okay? Utter madness. Okay? What we actually negotiated in the end is just that small area of excavation, because I, uh, by this stage, I just was saying no, because I didn't have any other record, and I just, well, I don't say no normally, it's just quite an extraordinary <laughs> scenario to get there. And it's not over, this road, this is you still going on. Right, uh, this down here, this photograph here, the reason I put this up is because you can see what we were trying to achieve now through um, revetment and, and soil nails. This is from the new bridge, six lanes of motorway, lovely. Both sides, most aware, uh, uh, scheduled monument, town, <coughs> archaeology stops and starts in the top three, it's three metres deep. Lovely. Okay. From day one, I told them I don't want any new fencing on this monument. No new fencing. Because, because every post you put in will have an impact, and I will make you do two metre square minimum slots. Okay. And then was absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Until they then come to me and say, well, unfortunately, the regulations say this is no longer an A road, this is a motorway, so it needs this style of fence. And yes, they want fence posts 750 millimetres deep. Uh, I can't guarantee they will be able to pile them in, drive them in, because we know there are socking great stone <coughs> structures in here. So I'm now in this mad scenario, mad scenario, where I'm potentially saying, well, you've got to do a slot 300 metres long, 2 metres wide, that you might even have to actually step out, because I know the archaeology is 3 metres deep. I say, can we just not build the fence? But more than that, what's really mad is why the hell did we do all these soil nails? Why, 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 have, we, why have we done the cutting? We might as well have just done the archaeology. And if we are doing the archaeology, I could have asked a whole series of different questions. I could have actually done something else and done something innovative and, and uh, you know, in relation. So again, what's really interesting here, this is where this other issue comes in, is, is you know, the design manual for own bridges, I'm sorry, it's, right. it's useless. 
for some of these issues. Because, of course, these things, services, fences, they're not built into the assessments. You know, we're not dealing with them in the environmental impact assessment. My, my other real bugbear is just down there, is electrical signage. Okay, that now sits in front of the best view you have of the Roman fort. The very reason why Catterick is there is the Roman fort set up on the hill. And they put a socking great electrical sign in front of it. Okay, and I, I just, there's nothing I could do to move it. I tried my absolute damnedest. Yeah, but ultimately the regulation says it needs to be so many metres from so many... And you just go on, and the engineers just ultimately browbeat you in this sense. Now, also, what I find really interesting in, in, in this scenario, to get to my other issue, this is now preservation in some senses, and um, PPG-16 and the PPG-16 approach. We, I know PPG-16 doesn't exist anymore, but by God, we still live under its ethos. Okay? And I just think it's really challenging and really damaging. I, I just pulled this one paragraph out from the MPPF, and I just want to go through it with you. One for one. Now, anyone know where this paragraph actually exists within the historic environment chapter of the MPPF? Yes? Whereabouts does it exist? It's the, it's the last paragraph! It's the bit we forgot about! Absolutely! Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a bit of footnotes and there's some appendices, but one for one. So this is everything we forgot about from PPG 16 that we thought we must, must have. Okay, so... Local planning authorities should make information about significance historic available. Fine, love that, really good. They should require developers to record an advanced understanding of significance. Brilliant, absolutely fantastic. I totally agree with that. And then we threw this sentence in. However, the ability to record evidence of our past should not be a factor in deciding whether such loss should be permitted. Sorry, I've just ruled out research. Okay, by reading that out. Because that is effectively what that is actually saying. Okay? Because again, what the MPPBF is about is balancing public benefits. And this is a legacy of us wanting to preserve stuff in situ, not to lose it. Or if we're going to lose it, look at it. And I just think we're really mixing up where we want to go with this. It's like we, we, we dare move on. We were so, we just have to slip it in there, and we don't really know what it means. Now, very interestingly, this paragraph is subject to a judicial review at the moment with regard to Clifford's Tower in York. And so in May, I'd actually listen out to see what actually happens about this because uh, at Clifford's Tower, the planning committee report seems to say that we could actually, the, depo the deposits that are going to be impacted can be excavated and we can learn something. Well, this paragraph says you shouldn't take that into account. Okay, so really interesting. How do we build that into into research? So again, it's my my approach. And my my bugbear was this was this whole idea that you know uh, what we're preserving and, and and some of those conversations and uh, the difficulty of actually um, you know not doing stuff when you really want to not do it. How difficult that actually is because the system drives us to do stuff. And of course. What you really then understand is under PPG 16 and the MPPF is mitigation is all for experts. And again, I think we really need to analyse what we think mitigation is. The MPPF definition of archaeological interest is for um, experts to look at something in the future. Okay? Well, it's not our place. There are people who live there who have far different meanings about this place. And, you know, we. Again, because the impact started to get so great, I was actually able to say, well, you've got, to, you've got to start reaching out to the community here and actually start talking to them about what you're doing in trashing their archaeology, yeah, and how you're trashing their place and what that actually means. And we were successful in getting a number of um, open days. But it does really highlight one of my other points about, about this. And again, this is Design Manual for Road and Bridges doesn't deal with this very, very well. And that is the social and cultural context of what we do. Okay? The A1. It's a fantastic road. But really interestingly, it forms the parish boundary of about 20 different parishes through North Yorkshire. It's a cultural entity in its own right. Okay? It's formed people's perceptions of that landscape for that long. There are no public footpaths crossing the A1, with the exception of Catterick, where a national footpath crosses it. 
which dates from the 1960s. Because they never did. Because it's always been that landscape barrier feature. Okay? Yet we have failed to engage any of the communities along this road. Yet those communities have been defined by this road for 2,000 years. And I personally think that's a real missed opportunity. We've done shed loads for archaeologists. I just don't think we've delivered any social benefits, any social value, any understanding and meaning to those local communities. And they are so crying out for it. Okay? And that's where I start to have real problems with some of these documents. Okay? Building the future, transforming our past. Who for? Archaeologists. Okay? Realising the benefits of planning. Who for? Archaeologists. Okay? The chariot was in that document. Okay? Do you know what I learned for the very first time, despite being instrumental in that being excavated, was that the person buried there probably was born in Scotland. Okay? Nobody told anyone. The archaeologists knew. Did the local community, did the place where the chariot is, know? No, they didn't. Wow! Let's just keep the information to ourselves, guys. Okay? But the other really interesting thing is actually the people who pay us to do stuff, they don't really care about us. Okay? Last week, two weeks ago, we did some press to actually say what we found on the A1 finally. And the day before, I was, I, I was told there were two press statements... Okay, one the national one, Historic England were doing, great archaeology, all this. Another one the Highway of England were actually doing, which actually said this. A1 work delayed because of archaeological discoveries. Cracking headline, that one, isn't it? <laughs> yep, that's what we're all after. Really important, you know, that the Highways England, they are, right, they are very concerned about legacy. What legacy are they leaving? And I'm just really concerned that as a sector... We are nowhere with this legacy debate, okay? Because we're still too damn obsessed with the products for our own ends. And we need to break out of this. We need to do something differently. We need to make uh, you know, a, a, a major step change. All right, just facts and figures. The archaeological costs will go over 10 million on this scheme easily now. And that is an absolute nightmare. And I know there is one person in this room who would just look at me and said, Neil, I told you, and you should have stopped it, and then I'm there saying, I can't, I couldn't stop it, because the, the impact on a scheduled monument was getting so great that I had to say, you, you know, so you've got to do it. Okay? But what is very interesting is, Highways England don't think the impact is £10 million. Pounds, okay? They told me, on one occasion, that it could, well, we could actually consider it to be £37 million. And I'm like, how the hell do you get to £37 million? That is the potential delay time in building the road scheme. Okay? So you might, as an archaeologist, you might keep a contractor on site for one day and you might have a cost for the archaeology. They have a totally different cost. Okay? If they've got a crane on hire, boom. You know, we're talking £300,000 a day delay costs. These are extraordinary. Okay? So that headline is seriously damaging. Because I said to them, we didn't cause the delay. The engineer who changed the designs caused the delay. Yeah? Well, that's a great headline, isn't it? We don't, our engineers don't know how to build a road. Uh, and so they, uh, they've taken too long. They're just not going to use it. And a, and a real issue about how we get into the real world on, on some of these things. And, and so where I get to on this is I just think, we just, there's too much archaeology going on. We're just doing too much. We can't do it. Okay. And there are, I think there are a whole load of really interesting questions that come out of this. Okay. What impact as archaeologists, what impact do we make? What impact do we have? Who, who do we have that impact for? Okay. Is it just for us or is it for the wider, the wider community? Is it for the local people? Is it for, for, for you know, people much more broadly? I mean, the really interesting thing, you know, Catterick's really fascinating. You've got a Roman settlement and a Roman fort, and you've got it next to England's largest military settlement. All right? Now, one of the things we did there with the road scheme is we actually got Operation Nightingale involved and we did some we paid for some excavations on the road on the scheduled monument and we started engaging about rehabilitation of, of ex servicemen and women and actually how they actually um, help them get back into society. Now that's all great and that's nice and fluffy and that's bit. But one of the, the two really brilliant conversations came out of that. The first one was a discussion about the material culture, those service 
personnel took to Afghanistan and what they did with it. Okay, and just one, uh, one way of actually articulating that. One of the most valuable pre possessions were CDs. CDs of films and CDs of music. The least valuable possession was the plastic case. The music came in. The CD came in. So what got thrown away? The CD case. And they kept the CDs, and the CDs were never lost. But, so, so if you go to Afghanistan now, you'll find lots of Western CD cases lying around. What does that actually mean about the material de deposition from the Romans? What can we read into that? How can we actually start to have that conversation? Okay. And another really fascinating thing is we have a huge Gurkha presence. So we went and I had a chat with the Gurkhas. What do you bring, guys? What do you bring? Okay, what's your most important possession? Okay, and fascinating, their most important possession. They say, oh, we lose buttons, we don't care anything. Oh, you know, our swords, we don't really care about that. Their most important possession was a small flag. Okay, and that flag is given to them by their families. And that is the thing they never, ever lose. Yeah, so what does that actually mean when you start to have that conversation of a, a you know, foreign troops coming to another country? So brilliant, that's why... I'm not just saying we shouldn't do archaeology. It's really huge value of learning. Um, the best conversation I've ever had about that chariot was with my colleague Keith Emmerich. He was driving to watch Huddersfield Town play football on the M62, and he was speeding, and he got pulled over. Excellent. And um, he was pulled over, and he had to say what he did, and he said he was an archaeologist. And the policeman said, Oh, my God, do you know, I'm really fed up. My colleague always makes me go and park on this bridge and uh, next to Ferry Bridge and look over this henge landscape he keeps talking about, saying all this archaeology was here. Okay. The reason why that chariot was dug was for the foundations of that road bridge. Yeah. And it sits right above the henge. You can see the henge landscape down there. You can do exactly what that policeman was saying. You can understand the exact landscape context of what was actually going on there. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, and I always said, I always thought that, that that guy in that chariot burial was probably the policeman of his day, on the A1 of his day. Yeah? But this is a way of engaging with people and actually, in a sense, t telling that story. So, there are my questions for you. I just think, you know, we have got into too much of a default system with the way we do archaeology. We're no longer thinking. I have loads of ideas for what you could do on High Speed 2, and a lot of it would be doing no archaeology. It would actually be sorting out a whole load of other issues that we could do interestingly. Yeah? How, again, these road schemes, when they're linear, they don't relate to places. So how do you make the archaeology relate to the place, relate to the people, relate to the community? Well, maybe we should stop doing the archaeology of the whole scheme and just choose five parishes and look at them in detail and do interesting things with them. Can okay? I quote you? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> You can. I, I've got all the evidence to say why. Um, I know my colleagues won't agree with me, but there we go. Um, so I think it's really, really important we actually start thinking about those things. And I could go on for absolutely hours. But I said I promised you three things that I would actually think we as a sector need to sort out and get rid of. And those three things are finite and non-renewable resource. Okay? I could swear, but I just think it's rubbish okay when have you ever known the number of archaeological sites to go down yeah. never <laughs> never it always goes up when has the number of questions gone down never it gets more it gets bigger it gets bigger okay we've got to just stop worrying about it and stop being so blooming precious it can go it's fine okay preservation just don't start me preservation <laughs> in situ what a load of rubbish okay it don't work okay and who is this m b amazing future generation? Who are they? Okay, my daughter, she's future generation. She disagrees with everything I say. Excellent, that's what I say. Her right to disagree, her right to view it differently. And protection, okay? And again, I just don't believe protection happens, it doesn't. Designation is the greatest driver of change because it changes your perception about something. Okay, so we've got to really think about what we're actually doing there. We've got to move into this idea of legacy, and we've got to move into this idea that our job is about understanding and enhancing cultural value, the cultural value of society, people in society, and how we actually do it. And we're done.